minimize it. Okay. All right, so thanks to everybody who showed up tonight. Um, happy to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Uh, it's always good to see new people. Um, so tonight's presentation is gonna be on night photography and what you need to succeed. This is not a presentation on how to run a photography business and make a lot of money. This is about how to create and capture good images with your camera and in shooting field techniques. I'm gonna go through about 50 slides and then we're gonna do some demonstrations where I'm actually gonna show you and put together some images. Um, I'm gonna show you guys how to do some noise reduction. I'm gonna show you how to stack images. I'm gonna show you how to blend some images, things like that. So that you'll actually get to see what, to see me practice what I preach, so to speak. So with that, I will get started. I'm going to make this, does that work good for you guys, the full screen? Yeah, that looks good to me. It does? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay, I just want to make sure. All right, so night photography, what you need to succeed. This is a shot that I took back in 2020 over the Abbott Church in Linden, Colorado with uh, Comet Neowice. Um, just, just a perfect night out there. So, so I am Darren. I have been doing photography for over 35 years. I've been a workshop instructor for over 15. I have customers and clients worldwide that include interior designers, magazine publishers, um, art consultants, interior decorators, um, and then just people who like to purchase prints for home and office decor. Um, I started back in 1987-ish with film and just have been working on my craft ever since. Um, I do have a, a philosophy that I like to work smarter, not harder. And so a lot of the things, a lot of people are very surprised at my post-processing. Um, they, they tend to think that post-processing should take hours and hours when that's not really the case. And I, I understand that as we learn the, the, the processes, it does take time to learn those. But once we, once we learn them and figure them out and we kind of have a nice little process down, um, I like to find the easiest way to do things. That's going to be the quickest with the best results. So there's a couple of those I'm going to show you tonight and, uh, hopefully they're new to you and that you'll be able to benefit from those. Um, I'm online all the time. My business is ran online. I'm on social media. You can find me at my main website, DarrenWhitePhotography.com. I've recently started. Yeah. I've recently started a new website, which is Let'sChaseLight.com. This is a photography blog um, where I sell fine art canvas prints and where I um, where I show my my workshops that I do along the Oregon coast. Um, Let's Chase Light is more like a community. Um, I use the blog to, um, I use the blog to share knowledge with other photographers in hopes that they can learn something as well. Um, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and then you can email me or message me through any one of these sites and I'll be happy to help you. So don't, I don't like people to get stuck with their photography. Um, that can be very frustrating. So if you run into any obstacles, please reach out and I'll be happy to help. I've worked with several companies over the years, but most recently I was a Sigma Lens Ambassador for four years. Um, I work with Robus Support tri tripods, and tripods and Ball Heads. Um, they're very similar to Really Right Stuff, but they're about a fraction of the cost. Um, I've had I've had their products now for close to three years and I absolutely love them. Um, I do some work with Moab Fine Art Papers and then I run a few of my workshops out of the Overleaf Lodge and Spa in Yahats, Oregon. All right, safety first, especially when we're going out to uh, photograph at night, it can be hard because most of us are working during the day and then you know we only got a week of maybe new moon 
So we're trying to go out at night, trying to take advantage of the clear skies. So it's good to get a lot of sleep before you go out or to plan your sleep during the day accordingly. Um, planning, know where to go. Um, don't just drive around aimlessly looking for something to shoot, kind of kind of make a plan, know where you're going, have gas, have food, bring the correct amount of lights, whether you're going to use them for hiking or you're going to use them for interior of a building that you may be shooting, or if you want to use the light to light up a building or light up your subject or your foreground, however that may be. Um, and I always just tell somebody where I'm going because a lot of the times the places I go are out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I want, I want somebody to know where I'm at in case something happens. Um, last year, I ended up getting stuck out on the plains. When I went out there, it was nice and dry and it started to snow while I was out there and the road turned to mud and I was stuck for almost 10 hours. So it was a disaster, but nobody got hurt. Everybody was safe. And uh, it's kind of a fun story to tell if you have time. I'd be more than happy to share it with you off offline. Um, keep it simple. What do you really need? All right. So after doing workshops for 10 to 15 years and, and working with many, many, many different people who have many, many different styles of photography, um, there's one thing that I, I've realized, and that is that a lot of people make not just night photography, but photography in general, more complicated than what it really is. So what do we really need? We need a camera. We need a sturdy tripod. Um, I prefer a tripod with no center column. Um, I say sturdy tripod because sturdy is uh, perceived differently by, by many different people. When we were doing the night photography workshops and we would tell people in the in the notes before the workshop, please bring a sturdy tripod because wind can have a direct effect on the outcome of your images. People would show up with these little me photo tripods that were only three feet high, and then they would take another, you know, foot and a half, and they'd raise the center column all the way up. And I mean, if somebody sneezed close by, it would vibrate the the tripod. So we really prefer. Uh, a good carbon fiber, sturdy tripod, preferably no center column. Uh, in one of the next screens, I'm going to show you, mine has a, a hook on the bottom of it. And if it's windy, I generally like to hang my bag on that hook for extra, um, extra weight and extra support. We need a wide angle lens, preferably 2.8 or faster. A lot of lenses and a lot of companies now are making 1.4 lenses, which is great. I've only found one 1.4 lens that's actually tack sharp at f 1.4, and that's the brand new Sigma 14 millimeter 1.4 lens. And it's razor sharp front to back, side to side, corner to corner at 1.4. And then a basic cable release. Um, so in this mode, I don't have a cursor. So anyway, um, a basic cable release, one that you just, plug into your camera and then you press it and lock it and that's it. No intervalometer. If you know how to use the intervalometer in your camera, that's fine too. Um, but I've seen more people screw up by trying to set an intervalometer than get good images from doing that. So intervalometers can be very intimidating. They can be hard to set up and unless it's something you do on a regular basis, I recommend just using a basic cable release. And then the willingness to adapt to new techniques. Um, if if you're somebody that just, you just want to know what your shutter speed is and your ISO and your f-stop, and you're going to go out and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to throw this up at 8,000 ISO for 15 seconds at f2.8. Great. I got my shot. I can go home. Yeah. You're probably not going to get the best image. You might get a good image, but it's not going to be the best. And then What's going to happen down the road is there's somebody that's going to like that image and they're going to say, wow, Joey, hey, can I get that printed, you know, 30 by 40? And you're going to look at that and you're going to be like, ah, I don't know. It's pretty noisy, pretty grainy. Um, you know, it's really not sharp because it because the noise is detracting from all the detail that potentially could be in the image. So I like to say, you know, be willing to adapt to new techniques. Um, that's how we get better. That's how we learn. 
So what are my goals? What are our goals? My goals as a photographer and to shoot at night are to get a well-exposed image, super low noise or no noise at all, and a lot of detail. Um, and not the kind of detail that you get by sliding the clarity tool all the way to the right. And then I want my images to have good color. And good color is something we're going to talk about um, in a little bit as well. So I want, but well exposed, I want my images, when people look at them, I want I want them to know what they're looking at. A lot of night photography you, you get is so dark, uh, it's hard to tell what's actually in the image. And my goal is for that not to happen and for people to not have to guess what they're looking at. All right, so DSLR or a mirrorless camera, generally they're 12 to 61 megapixels. Probably everyone has one. Shoot raw and you can shoot on continuous mode. Now, I've added a little note here. After the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been testing different cameras, different megapixels and so forth. And I have truly found that the best cameras for night photography are between 24 and 45 megapixels. I have used two 61 megapixel cameras and they do not do very well. Um, sure, you can you can do some techniques to overcome the limitations of that, but in general, the lower megapixel cameras do much better for night photography. All right, so where to spend your money? Let's say you got a couple of grand laying around, you got an outdated camera. What's that? Okay. Oh. So if you got a couple of grand laying around and you got an outdated camera or you have the opportunity to buy a new lens, I highly recommend that you purchase a new lens first. So I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. About four or five years ago, we were teaching a workshop in Moab and there was a lady who came to the workshop with this camera, this Nikon D3400 camera. It's, it's a $400 camera. I think it's only 12 or 16 megapixels. I'm not sure. Anyway, but she had a $1,500 lens on her camera that the company that she was working for at the time, they said, you take the camera and we'll get the lens. Okay, so just for kicks, we set up side by side. I, I was shooting the same lens with a Nikon D850. We set up side by side. We took the same amount of images. We took them back into the classroom. We did the exact same thing to them. And when we were done, you could not tell which image was shot with the D3400 or the D850. So it's more important that the light that passes through the lens that hits the sensor is the better quality because you can overcome the limitations of the camera, but you're never going to be able to overcome limitations of the, of the lens. So you always want to have the best lens that you possibly can. If you, if you need to wait to upgrade your camera, that's fine. Spend the money on the lens first. Then generally for shooting at night, we're using a 14 to 35 millimeter lens, 1.4 to 2.8. Um, like I just talked about, the lens is more important. Generally, I don't shoot my lenses wide open unless I'm shooting a 2.8 lens. If I have a, if I have a, you know, like a 1.4 lens, I'll generally shoot it at 2, 2.2, something like that. Just to, just to make sure that we can eliminate some of the coma in the corners. That's generally happens from shooting wide open on wide angle lenses. All right, so a sturdy tripod. Generally, it's a carbon fiber, has the bigger, thicker legs. It's either a three or four section leg um, tripod, uh, a proper ball head. So when I say proper ball head, I'm talking about what you see here in the picture. You got a ball head and you got you know, you got two screws, you got one that tightens it down and loosens it. And there's a little tension knob there. And then on the other side, there's one that you can, a smaller one that you can loosen and then you can rotate the base. Um, lately, I've been seeing a lot of people come to workshops with these, these ball heads that have like six or seven different angles and maneuver and ways to move it. And it's, and most of the time that the people don't know how to use them and I don't know how to use them. So just a, a simple ball head that is recommended for the weight of your camera and lens is really all you need. Um, I also highly recommend an L bracket. You can kind of see it here on this, this picture of my camera. There's an L bracket on there. And by using an L bracket, 
you don't have to have your can if you want to shoot vertical you don't have to have your camera hanging off the side of your tripod you can just turn the camera up vertical and it keeps the center the weight centered on the tripod and that that does a lot for um keeping the camera steady and lessening the chances of it of it moving or the weight of the camera potentially um twisting where the 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 mount would be on the bottom of the camera All right, basic cable release. Um, these are like seven dollars at DNH. I usually buy three or four at a time. Uh, they last. They last a long time, but I buy them because if people don't have them, I'll generally give them to them. Um, they basically you just press and hold and let the let the shutter do the work. There's no. It takes the guesswork out of everything. You don't have to worry about fiddling with an intervalometer, making mistakes, not getting the shots. So basic cable release. Shooting techniques. All right, so blue hour blends will give you the optimal print quality, multiple images for noise reduction, high ISOs. So a lot of people like to shoot ISO 3200, ISO 64, you know, and they're generally in the 20 to 30 second range when it's really dark out. Um, that's okay, but depending on your lens, you're probably going to get a little bit of star trailing. So what I like to do is I like to shoot a little bit higher F, um, ISO, 8,000, 10,000, 12,800, so I can cut that shutter speed time down. Now there's going to be a little bit more noise, but through the stacking technique, that noise is all going to go away. So I don't have to worry about my ISO until I'm up to like 25,600. But then even then, I have something to show you on that as well. So with, with stacking, generally what we aim for is anywhere between 25 and 36 images. If you shoot 10 images, you will get some noise reduction. Um, it, it The way to figure it out is it kind of like the square root of whatever the number is you're shooting. So if you're shooting nine images, you're approximately going to get a three time noise reduction. So if you're shooting at ISO 6400 and you're going to get a three time noise reduction, that means that the um that means that the final image will look like it was shot at 3216 like 800 ISO. So for some people that's acceptable. Uh for myself it's not. Um especially when I'm I'm blowing images up fairly big, you know, 40 by 60 48 by 72, things like that. So I want as, as little noise as possible. And the, the higher my ISO, the more images I'll shoot to compensate for the noise. So here's a raw file and a final image. And this is kind of a discussion I've been having with quite a few people lately is people are, I'm finding that more and more people are frustrated that their raw files don't look very good. Um, and this could be at night or during the day, but, but here's the thing, your raw file can only look so good. It doesn't matter if you have the most epic, epic conditions and you have your camera set at the exact right settings. The raw file is only going to look so good. It can't look any better than the histogram can make it. I mean, the histogram can be perfect. Everything can be you know, dialed in, but the raw file is is just going to be the raw file. And then it's up to us as as artists and, and creators to to edit that and create our own vision with it. Um, so don't worry so much about what the raw file looks like. As long as your histogram is good, then you have the data to work with. So in this image, this, sorry that the the yellow lettering on the right is not legible, but that's okay. I'll tell you what this is. So here is the histogram on the top. It is showing a very underexposed image. But if you were to be out at night in the dark and you take this picture, your eyes are going to trick you to thinking, wow, that looks good. I can see the stars. I can see the cabin. I can see the snow on the mountains. I can see the trees and I can see a little bit of the green grass there behind the cabin. And you might say, wow, that's great. I'm going to take all my shots like that. But if we look at the histogram, 
you can see that it's horribly underexposed. You have all you have all the dark tones, but you have none of the mid tones and none of the brights. So what do we do? So on this, for an example, instead of changing the um, shutter speed because I was already at thirty seconds, I changed my ISO. So I went from four hundred up to sixteen hundred to the middle one. Now the middle one is a lot better. It shows some of the mid tones. It shows that the darks are moved off of the left hand side. And now we're getting into a, a range of acceptable image quality for a raw file, but we're still missing the bright brights. Now I'm not saying to blow out the brights, but I say we want to get that histogram over into the right hand quadrant where 50% of all the information of a digital file is. So by increasing it again from 1600 up to 3200, now we have a good range of, of Dy a good dynamic range with our histogram. We have we have the darks, we have the midtones, and we have the the brights. And obviously, the brights are going to be the blue with the sky and the reflection and whatnot. But still, we've we've brought that up. So that bottom image is actually the preferable image that you'd want to start working with. And at night, when you shoot this on the back of your camera, it's going to look horribly blown out. But the histogram tells us different and it's not blown out. Um, there's not one part of this image that's blown out. So if we can, we want to try to expose to the right as much as possible and get as much good data in our images as possible because the more good data that we have to work with, the better our images are going to look. So this is just kind of a quick uh, detour here. So this is a raw file shot with my Nikon D850, which has been astro modified with the visible plus H alpha filter. Um, it was done by a Spencer camera. The raw files on the left, then with just some basic raw processing, you can see the nebula colors in the middle there. And then my final edit on the right, you can see a lot of the nebula colors that come out. And those, those magentas and the yellows, um, a lot of those you can't pick up with a regular camera. So having an astro modified camera, just uh, it's just kind of another tool in my bag that I like to have. And I like to shoot when I have super, super dark skies. I like to pull out the astro modified camera and use that. Um, I recommend if people are really into night photography and they want to do something a little bit different and they have a spare camera um, to consider having one camera modified for night photography and then have another camera that's for your landscape portrait and whatever other kind of work you do. So if you like the colors in the Milky Way and the night sky and the nebula regions of the night sky, I highly recommend a uh, an astro modified camera. All right. So this is a big one. And this is a discussion I got into with some people here a while back. Why do we shoot multiple images? Why do we blend images? So the answer is pretty simple, to overcome the limitations of our cameras. So when you're out at night and you're looking at the sky and you're enjoying what you're seeing, does your brain see the noise or the grain that the camera picks up? No, it doesn't. So why would you want your images to be noisy or grainy? So this goes back to where, you know, you go out and you shoot one shot at 8,000 ISO and you think, wow, I got this shot. It's awesome. You go home. Well, my brain doesn't translate the noise that I see on my images into my scene because when, what I was seeing when I was out, it wasn't, the noise wasn't there. So I don't want my images to look like that. So I'm going to show you guys how to overcome some of those limitations. So we're just going to take a look at a few examples here real quick, and I'll kind of describe them. Hey, Darren. Yeah. Can, can we hold on for just a second? We've got a couple of questions. Okay, let's go. Uh, let me see. Uh, Janet wants to know how astro modified cameras are modified. Okay, there's two ways. Um, mine is done. It actually has a filter over the sensor. So my camera no matter what i shoot my raw files are going to be red and then i do the color correction um once i get back home and i do the post processing there are some filters that you can get that either attach to the front of your lens or 
you can get the clip on inside your camera that will do the same thing. So they're like, it's hard to explain because I've never actually seen one, but they're like little tiny clips, filter clips that would like go over your sensor that capture the same wavelength of light. And then you can take those in and or take them out and put them in as needed. Just like the ones with the that go on the front of your camera. Um, I just chose to have mine modified. So they physically went in and they put a filter over the sensor. Very cool. Okay. And then uh, Sarah Miller is asking um, uh, about recommending something. And I'm not sure, Sarah, maybe you can clarify this. Are you asking about uh, L brackets? I'm guessing that's what she wants to know is, is can you recommend an L bracket for her? Um, so there's, there's a ton of L brackets and they make them for each model camera. So if she just goes on to like say B and H website and types in her camera model number and L bracket, it'll bring up all the L brackets that'll work for her camera. I've used really right stuff. I've used Sunway photo. Um, those are the two that I've used. I, I believe that Sunway photo works really good. I've never had an issue with it, and it's a fraction of the cost of the really right stuff. Um, the one thing that you do want to be careful of is do read the reviews because some of the L brackets, it, this is interesting, some of the L brackets aren't optimally designed so that it's not super easy to get your like cable release or whatever cord you're using with your camera into the side slots. So there are some that are designed better than others based on the camera model. That's that's really good advice. I appreciate that. I um I actually had a really right stuff uh L bracket that covered my battery uh, yeah. uh door and so I returned it. It's like what the heck? I can't have an L bracket that's covering the battery door. I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, so yes, you definitely need to make sure that you got the right one. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's, let's keep going. Thank you for that. Yep. No problem. I can't see the chat or anything. So if there's anything that comes up, just let me know. You bet. Okay. So <clears throat> the image on the left is basically the same shot shot back to back. The image on the far left is an 8,000 ISO single shot. And we can see how horribly noisy it is. So then I then I took a shot at 200 ISO and I just let it run for this is probably about 15 or 20 minutes and you can see that there's no noise at all especially in the foreground um, it's a beautifully clean image so years ago my my thought process was well I'll take a static sky and get that as good as I can and then I'll do a long exposure foreground and then I'll put the static sky with the foreground and that would help to um, eliminate some of the noise in the image. So then the image over here on the left is, or on the right, I'm sorry, is the same thing. You have your high ISO, short shutter speed image on the left-hand side. And then I have another one that I did, which was a long exposure right after that. And that's on the right-hand side. So you can see the difference in the clarity between the two sides of each image. All right, so then what I started to do, <clears throat> again, we have a, a single, if I can get rid of this, I don't know if I can, okay. Um, so in, on the top, there's three, there's three panels. The first one on the left is a single 8,000 ISO image. And you can see the horrible, horrible decoloration of the, of the ground. You can see even where I started to get purple fringing on the, on the bottom there. So then I decided, well, I'll take eight, I'll take 21 of those images and I'll stack them together and I'll get what's in the middle panel. That's 21 images stacked and the sky looks much better and the building is much less noisy, but it doesn't do anything with the ground. So one thing to keep in mind is that as your ISO goes up, your dynamic range goes down. And when your dynamic range goes down, the color in your images goes from good to bad. So 
it doesn't matter if I were to stack 500 of these images together, the grass, you're never gonna bring the green grass color back from high ISO images, even if you're stacking them. So what I like to do is I'll take one image at a low ISO, like you see here on the right-hand side, that's seven minutes long at 100 ISO, and you can see how good the grass looks compared to the other two. So this is one benefit of when you're out there and you're shooting, no matter how good the scene is, if you arrive at night, I highly recommend you shoot at least one image as a long exposure at a lower ISO just for the foreground so that you can then blend in your stacked sky to there, to the foreground. And then like you see on the bottom, you got the good green color of the grass with the nice colors of the Milky Way. So we went from doing single images to doing stacked images with long exposure foregrounds to better the quality of your subject and also match it better with the sky. And then here we got, again, we have the, the one single image on the left-hand side and the, the good grass and the good green yellows on the right-hand side. Okay, so this is a this is a test that I did. Um, it was in September, probably, I don't know, this is probably about four or five years ago. We hiked up to Delicate Arch in Arches National Park. When we left the trailhead, it was 94 degrees. And if you've ever shot in the summertime when it's super hot out, you know that as your camera sensor heats up, the noise in your images becomes more prevalent. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a test. So I, I, we got our workshop students all set up. They're all happy. They got the Milky Way. They got Delicate Arch. They're shooting away. So I walked back and I walked up onto this hill and I just let my camera run. I set it up at 25,000 ISO. I believe these are, uh, I believe these are like two second shots a piece and I just let it run. And I went back and I checked it later. Anyway, make a long story short, the image on the left is a single image and it's absolutely unusable. The noise is horrible, even running it through the most modern day noise reduction um, software would not clean it up. The image on the, the right is 256 images stacked together and there's no noise in it. So this is an image I like to use to emphasize the power of stacking images and why we stack images for night photography. So it's a pretty big difference. Um, I personally like to shoot image. I personally like to shoot uh, night photography in the early spring or the late fall or during the winter because it's cooler out. <clears throat> it keeps your sensor temperature down and it keeps the, the noise down too. All right, so this is this is a classic sequence of events that um, I would say that a lot of people do, but here's here's what happened to me. In image number one on the upper left, I arrived at this location. The Milky Way was in a perfect spot. I set up, I shot, I left. Image two is the stacked image of all of the images that I had shot in number one. And you can see that there's a visible difference in much less noise and everything. But if you look in the images one and two, you'll see my shadow in the lighter space just to the left of the church or the school. I didn't see that until I got home because it was so dark out. I arrived. I was, I was happy to be shooting. I set up, I shot, I focused. And I was like, this is cool. I got the shot. Well, I got home and I realized that that's not going to work. I didn't like the shadow. I didn't like how dark the foreground was. I didn't have any external lights. There was a big light behind me that was causing the shadow. I just, I didn't even realize that until after the fact. So I went back the next day and that's image number three. I went back the next day. It was perfectly overcast. There was no shadows. It was even lighting and it was, it was just perfect for what I wanted to do. 
So then I took the stacked sky from number two and I put it with the image of number three to get image number four. And this is pretty much what I do now all the time. And I'm not saying to shoot something and then go back the next day. But what we do now is generally we'll shoot our foregrounds at sunrise or sunset or on an overcast afternoon or something like that. But generally it's within within the same same day and we're not leaving and coming back. But anyway, generally we shoot our foregrounds, um, like I said, sunrise, sunset, overcast day, and then blend them with the night sky. So you can see that the Milky Way, I didn't, I didn't change the position of the Milky Way any. It's all it's it's in the exact position. What I did was I just shot the foreground to get a much cleaner foreground, much more natural looking foreground without my shadow, and then create the final image. So this is what most photographers are doing today is blending stacked sky images with um blue hour or golden hour foregrounds and then i did the same thing here um, i arrived at the location i shot the foreground this is a focus stacked foreground so i started um i started my focusing right towards the the tip of the the log there that's in the foreground and i just focused all the way through and i got that foreground and then i i later that night I just moved over to the side a little bit to get a nice clean Milky Way shot. And then I put the two together, the image on the left. So one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things that's really hard to do is let's say I would have kept my camera in the exact same position. So I would have focus stacked the house and then waited four or five hours and then took the exact same shot again with the Milky Way in it. It would be so much harder to blend with the the house in both images than it is to just get a good clean image of the Milky Way and put that in and mask out the sky of the house that you shot at sunrise or sunset. So you don't have to move very far. In fact, you can see you can see the post in the the sky image that's kind of back there on the right hand side of the house. So I just moved over a little bit, got a good clean picture of the sky at night, and then blended the two together. Here's a couple other blends, um, especially at night on the beach. If you want to do this kind of photography, you definitely have to shoot your foreground in the morning or in the late evening uh, to get images like this. You can't shoot these at night because even a 15 second image would not capture this kind of detail. The image on the right is shot up on Mount Evans. It is a, the foreground was shot at sunset as the sun was setting behind us. And I focus stacked the foreground so that it's, all the flowers are sharp all the way through up through the tree. And then I just, I, we stayed there I don't know, several more hours and we shot the Milky Way and then I just blended the two together. Uh, panoramas. This is something we don't talk a lot about, but there are certain times of the year when you can actually photograph both ends of the Milky Way as panoramas. So here's on the top is and the bottom, that's looking one direction. And then early in the morning in the middle is looking the other direction. So it's kind of cool to, to see both, both ends of the Milky Way within the same night. Um, but panoramas are a good way to increase your file size without um, having to like buy a, a bigger camera or more megapixels. Um, just by shooting a panorama, you increase the file size. It gives off less perceptible noise and um, they're kind of fun to do. And then these are just a couple examples. The image on the the image on the right with the tent is a single exposure down at Lake uh, Lake George at Eleven Mile Reservoir. And then the image on the left was shot at Arches National Park, probably I'm going to say about eight years ago. And it's a three shot panorama starting at the bottom, and then one for the middle, and then one for the top. Um, they don't allow light painting there anymore but I was able to get a larger file size out of this by doing a panorama. 
so it helps with the printing. The image on the left is of maroon bells, obviously. And what I did here was I took one shot of the of maroon bells as the moon was coming up. And then I took another shot of the Milky Way. And while the exposure was, uh, while the camera's shutter was open, I just zoomed my lens a little bit to give it that burst. And I'll be honest, I don't know which way I went. I don't know if I went from wide to, to telephoto or telephoto to wide, but this is kind of a fun technique to play around with and then you can blend the two together. So it looks like the stars are kind of exploding. So I kind of like that. The image on the right is of Balanced Rock in Arches National Park. And that is the Northern end of the Milky Way um, looking to the east. And that's in the November time and you get the Cygnus and Denab and um, the northern the northern side of the Milky Way that's much more prevalent in the winter than it is in the summer. And this is Grand Teton National Park. This is uh, Schwabacher Landing. And I think, can you guys see the iridium flare at the very top? Can you guys see that? Um, so this is a shot that we had planned out with our workshop students. Uh, we knew we knew that there was going to be an iridium flare and we knew exactly what time. What we didn't know was how high up it was going to be from where we were going to be standing. So we had the shot planned out. We were all there. And then some people didn't have wide enough angle lenses and they they missed the iridium flare by, I mean, just outside of the frame. But this was shot when the, the moon was up. You can see it's got good lighting on the on the trees and the mountains. So iridium flares are kind of fun to shoot and they are predictable. And uh, there are less of them now because they're switching the panels on the satellite. They're not, um, they're switching all the iridium ones out. So they're not actually iridium flares anymore. And the ones on the, the newer ones aren't as reflective. So um, there are still some out there though. And you can, you can, go to i think it's the it's called heavens above website and it'll tell you when they're going to pass over where where you're at this is a this is what i like to call a focal length blend i shot this from inside double arch in arches national park i did a an 11 minute foreground exposure for the for the rocks in the foreground and then during that exposure there was a car that went around the the parking area and then after that was done, I put on a, a slightly longer lens and I did the sky and then I just blended the two together. So I, I like to do a lot of focal length blends. Um, one of the reasons is because our eyes see at 50 millimeters or equivalent to what a 50 millimeter lens sees. So if you put on a 14 millimeter lens, you have this little, little thin strip of Milky Way going through your sky. And that's not really natural to what our eye sees. So I prefer to shoot my Milky Ways anywhere between, um, generally between 20 and 35 millimeters, just to make them a little bit more natural looking. Uh, this is the Big Dipper with uh, the North Star and Cassiopeia over this old abandoned house in um, in Kansas. This is all natural. The, the diffusion of the stars is because of the clouds that were in the sky that night. This is the Aurora Schoolhouse. Uh, this is just a long exposure with the clouds moving. Got a little bit of a glow from Denver back there. This is Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. Uh, a friend and I had permission to be on the property uh, for a couple of nights and shoot some stars with the uh, telescope. So that was kind of neat. And in the middle here, you can see the zodiacal light that's coming up that happens in the spring. And this is an example I like to show of what light pollution can do to your images. Um, depending on how you look at it, it can be good or it could be bad. This is one that um, I find very colorful because there was so much light pollution, but the light pollution didn't carry as far as I thought it would because the Milky Way is still very, very visible. So I, maybe the clouds had something to do with blocking a lot of the light. 
but um it's an image i enjoy it's from my hometown and so it's it's rare that on the oregon coast you get to see the milky way like this so it's just one i like to share of light pollution all right so focus stacked foregrounds shot at blue hour with a stacked sky and then blended together so this is how this is how you're going to get tack sharp images front to back no noise even in your sky uh let's see so i think we talked a little bit about this already most cameras that are 10 years old they're still good for night photography um the the better your lenses are you want the light to be able to pass through better glass to hit the sensor the sensor we can overcome those limitations um yeah we, we covered this sorry this is hey kinda... darren yeah do you want to take a few questions sure okay we actually have quite a few okay um let me see i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna skip a couple of them because um maybe we can ask those at the end uh steve allen wants to know how do you deal with objects that sway in the breeze such as trees and bushes um so that's that's a great question um if you're there at night it's pretty much impossible to do that that's one of the reasons i like to arrive at sunset is to shoot those with a faster shutter speed and to eliminate that motion okay fred wants to know is a star tracker required for stacked images no in fact a star a star tracker actually takes the place of stacking but you can use a tracker and shoot multiple images and then stack those as well the purpose of a tracker is generally to shoot a longer exposure at a lower iso while the tracker allows your camera to move with the motion of the sky so there's generally not any trailing of the stars so with one image on a tracker, you're generally able to get something very similar to what like 25 images would be if you were stacking. There's a couple of issues with that though. And I think they're I think they're getting better with the tracker technology, but to the best of my knowledge, in order for you to be able to shoot with a tracker, you have to be able to align it with the North Star. If it's cloudy, you can't do that. So let's say that you're shooting down in by Colorado Springs and the Milky Way is to the south, but it's just super cloudy up in Denver and you're you're try and you have a tracker and if you can't align that tracker with the north star, it, it's not going to do you any good. Um because the tracker has to be able to be polar aligned in order to know what the rotation is or you know where its location is on the earth. So that's one reason that I don't use a tracker. The other reason is, is because it's more equipment and I just don't wanna carry any more equipment than I already have. And um, so those are the two main reasons why I don't use a tracker. But, but to answer his question, yes, you can use a tracker and you can also use the tracker to take multiple images to then stack. So, does that I hope that answers his question. Yeah, I've got I've got two questions from Steve Allen. Uh first he wants to know if you need to put a disclaimer for an image because it's been composited or blended. And then also if you could throw in a couple of thoughts about Starlink. Um okay, so I'll just touch on Starlink first. Um with with the stacking technology. Sure. So let me back up. I'll, I'll say that I'm I'm not against having things in the night sky, but yes, it can take away from the enjoyment of viewing the night sky. But all of the times that I've been out shooting and stargazing, I haven't really seen a lot with my naked eye that would take away my enjoyment from doing that. Now, if you go out at night and you take 500 images, or you want to put a time lapse together when you put that time lapse together then you will see all of the satellites and all of the airplanes and all of the 
you know, if Starlink is going by that night, you'll see the International Space Station if it's going by. And that can kind of mess up your, your time lapse. But depending on how you look at it, it also shows you what's up in the night sky. So um, I'm not against Starlink. They're Eventually, they're going to get all their satellites up there and they won't be in this big long line. Um, I know it went over tonight. There were some people posting about it, you know, and you know, you see it a couple of times and it's kind of neat to see it. Um, so I'm not, not for it or against it. It's just technology. But when you take multiple images and you stack them, whether it's satellites, Starlink or airplanes, all of those go away because the stacking eliminates everything that's not constant in the image or in one place. So Airplane trails, satellite trails, things like that, they all disappear. So you don't have to sit there with your clone tool or your healing brush and try to eliminate all of them. So for me, removing those is, is a non-issue. Oops, I was on mute. Um, sorry. The, okay. the other part of the question was, do, do you want to uh, feel that you need to put a disclaimer if the uh -oh. image is a composite or a blend? Um, if it's a composite, I mean, you, you can. Um, like I have a picture of the Northern Lights that I shot in Iceland that are over the Delicate Arch in Utah. Yeah, that's a composite. It's, it's fairly obvious, but like, I don't, I don't put a disclaimer, you know, saying something specific. I mean, it's pretty much known that that's a composite or I'll say, Hey, this is a composite, but that's about it. Um, for images like this, absolutely not. This is a 100% real image. Um, I was standing with my workshop group next to, you know, 15 other people, you know, we shot, we all had planned to shoot this, at sun sunset we stayed there we waited till the milky way came into position we shot it i mean i could take you there at the same day that i shot this and you would see the same scene so this is this is a blend i guess you would call it of a real scene it's not a single image i shot the foreground and i focus stacked the foreground so that everything would be sharp and then i put that image together and then I did a stack for the sky and I put that image together. And then I just put the sky exactly where the, where the Milky Way was in relation to the rocks when we were there. So for an image like this, this is just a, a basic blue hour blend of a real scene. There's, there's nothing unreal about this image. So I wouldn't, I mean, I would tell people it's a blue hour blend, but, um, as as time progresses in the night photography community, um, most people are are up to date on this kind of stuff. Most people are using these practices to better their images. Um, sure, there's always a few people that they don't know, and if they ask, I'll tell them. Okay, I got give you give you uh, one last comment slash question. Uh, this is from Ron Pearson. Uh, he says the night sky and Milky Way are not blue. Why do so many night photographers expose and shift the, shift the sky and the Milky Way to blue? The natural color of the Milky Way is yellowish or almost brown. Exposing to bring up blue sky is also increasing the noise because there is so little actual blue color. It only re increases the noise even more. Do you have a comment for that? Um, so regardless of whether you're shooting night photography or daytime images or any other type of photography, you as the photographer have to like the colors that are in your images. So I understand there's several people who, who say that the, the Milky Way in the night sky is orange because of the dust and the particles and stuff that's up there. And that's fine. Um, when I'm out at night and I am shooting, I don't see the orange up there. I see more blues and darker tones. Um, and when I 
finish processing an image, I have to like the colors of it. So I'm going to make it look how, how I like it. Um, that's the best that I can say. That's, that's not a, that's not a topic that I'm going to argue anybody with because everybody has their own uh, perception of what they think that the Milky Way should look like or whatnot. But I can tell you from, from seeing plenty of images where people have posted and said, this is the true color of the Milky Way being like a, a mustardish, orangish brown. That's not pleasing to my eye. So I'm not going to I'm not going to make it look like that. As far as the noise goes, I, I'll i be honest, I don't even worry about noise anymore because I eliminate it from my images. So I can't say that if you shoot the Milky Way at 3,800 Kelvin temperature as opposed to 8,000 Kelvin temperature, that there's going to be any more or less noise in either one of those images if they're shot at the same ISO. So that that I have no no knowledge of. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to let you continue on. I apologize for having oh, so that's many good. questions. Good you. questions. I want I want people to to learn and ask questions because that's how we all that's how we all benefit. Okay. So shooting with a purpose. So plan your shot. Know what's going to be in the night sky when you get out there. Have a good foreground that complements the night sky. I see a lot of people who, you know, they everybody wants to learn how to shoot the night sky and they want to, they want to get a picture of the Milky Way. So they go out, they point their camera at the sky and they take a picture and wow, I got the Milky Way in the back of my picture. Okay. So that's fine. You got a good picture of the Milky Way, but, but we need, we need a, a sky. We need a foreground. We need something that kind of tells a story a little bit. So to make the image a little bit more compelling to the viewer. So, so try to, I do a lot of scouting on Google earth. Um, my favorite things to do are to shoot, old buildings and schoolhouses and things like that. So for me personally, that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for um, to have the night sky over those types of buildings and subjects. So it's rare that I ever just take a picture of the night sky unless I'm just going to use that to blend in with, um, with one of my subjects. Decide the technique that you want to use. Do you want to shoot a long exposure and have star trails? Do you want to shoot a lot of short images and have and, and use those to stack when you when you shoot a lot of short images there's a lot more that you can do than if you just shoot one long image so even if you want to shoot a star trail that's a full circle that's fine go ahead you can do that problem is when you get home you have one image to work with and that's it and I, I learned this many, many years ago, the hard way I'd get home and I'd have, excuse me, I'd get home and I'd have like 15 super long exposures, like 20 to 30 minutes. And I'm like, all right, well, this is boring. I have, this is all I got. So now what I generally do is if I'm out, I'll set my camera up and I'll just let it run, just shooting back to back to back images, because then I can stack the images for noise reduction. I can create star trails. I can create a time lapse if I want. I can do comet-like star trail processing to where my my stars look like they're comets raining down on the subject. There's just there's just so much more that you can do with multiple images that you can't do with just one or two images. So I like to use the technique where I'm shoot just I shoot a lot of images. Um, be mindful of your focus and exposure. This is this is something I've seen time and time and time and time again. And it's something that I've been a victim of myself. Um, you get out there, you, you check your focus, you check your exposure, you start shooting, everything's good. You get your 50 images or so of this one subject. And then you think, well, I want to move my camera over here. So you move your camera to the next spot and, you know, the light hasn't changed any. So you just start taking pictures again. But but what happens is by moving your camera, picking it up, setting it down, your focus will your focus will adjust a little bit and you'll take another 50, 60 images and you'll look at them and they'll be out of focus. And you're like, what the heck? So I always recommend, even myself, 
anytime I move my camera, I always refocus my camera and I always make sure that it's focused before I start another sequence. Um, so yeah, every time you move your camera for a new composition, check your focus. Exposing to the right is always best when possible. Consider high ISOs and shorter shutter speeds for pinpoint stars um, and knowing that stacking will reduce the noise. So I don't have this in here, but if people aren't familiar with, there's something that's called the 500 rule. And we use 500 just as, just to take the, make the math a lot easier. So if you have, if you have a 50 millimeter lens, you divide 50 into 500 and you get 10. So that means that you can shoot with a 50 millimeter lens at 10 seconds, theoretically, before the before your stars are going to start to trail. So if you shoot a 20 second exposure with 50 millimeters, you're definitely going to see star trailing. So they also have a 400 rule and they also have a 600 rule. The 600 rule Either the 600 rule or the 400 rule is for crop sensor cameras. I can't remember which one it is. I use the 500 rule and then I just try to shorten my shutter speed a little bit from that. And that makes the math easy for me. So if you don't want star trailing, try to remember that whatever millimeter your focal length is, divide that into 500 and whatever that number is, that's, that's the longest you can go before you're gonna start getting star trails. All right, so what apps do I use to plan? I like to use photo pills and I like to use Stellarium. So in this example, we have photo pills, the, the phone app here on the left-hand side showing exactly what my plan was on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, you can see my pin and then the dots, the white dots are where the Milky Way is. So just to the right of the house, the orange and the yellow are the sunrise and the sunset and the light blue and the dark blue are the moonrise and the moonset. So I planned this out and a friend and I, we went out to this house, we got there and I put photo pills up in the augmented reality um, portion of it. And I saw that the Milky Way was going to be exactly on the right hand side of the house, right where it was. And then later that night, that's exactly where it was. So I really like to use photo pills to plan shots of places where I know is has good opportunity. Um, I can also use photo pills to plan, plan if I have never been to this location before, then I can just figure out when the Milky Way is gonna be in the right spot. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do in photo pills It has the night augmented reality, you can save your plans. So I could I could make this as plan one or plan two or night shoot at the old house or whatever it is. Um, you can save your plans so that you can go back to them. Um, but this gives you a really good example of how accurate photo pills really is. So I plan the shot, I arrived at the location, I yes, use the augmented reality. I used the augmented reality to make sure that that's where it was going to be. And then we shot later that night and that's exactly where the Milky Way was. So photo pills is a great, I think it's like $10 and it's well worth the money. And then I like to use Stellarium. Stellarium is good for if you know the location already and you're just kind of wanting to play around and see what's going to be up in the night sky. Um, if you've already if you're already in a spot and you want to use the augmented reality feature of that, you can use that as well. And then it's good for beginners because it, it's not nearly as complicated as photo pills. Photo pills has a lot to it. There's only a few things in photo pills that I use, but Stellarium is very basic and it, it's, it does a really good job of showing the night sky in the right location. Okay, how to focus in the dark. So you arrive, you arrive at your location in the dark. It's pitch black. You know, you can, you turn your camera on, uh, get it set up and whatnot. So the first thing I do is I attach the camera to the tripod. I leave the camera off unless it's a mirrorless camera. Uh, before I do anything, I set my lens at infinity. Um, 
some of the new mirrorless lenses do not have an infinity marker on the lens. So um, this isn't so much for that. Uh, find a bright star. It doesn't matter what the bright star is. Looking through your optical viewfinder and place it in the center. Then turn the camera on, turn live view on, and then zoom in on the live view to 100%. And you should see if your camera lens is set at infinity, you should see that star in the center of your frame. And once you see that, then you can just fine tune the focus a little bit until you get that star as pinpoint as possible. The reason that we set the lens at infinity to begin with is because if we're not, if we're not at infinity or we're not even close to infinity, the, the, the image will be so blurry that you'll never see a star. So by turning the, setting the lens at infinity to begin with, then you'll see the dots of light in the sky and you'll be able to find a star much easier. Um, make sure that the star is as tiny as possible and then take a test shot. And once you take the test shot, zoom in on that and look and make sure that that star is as sharp as possible. If it's not, you might want to try it again and just kind of fine tune the focus just a hair till you get that star as sharp as possible. And then once you do that, you want to make sure that your camera is set to manual focus and then you recompose and you shoot and then take another test shot. Make sure that your focus has not adjusted. And then, because usually, it, usually when you recompose and shoot, you're not picking up the tripod and moving it. You're just loosening the ball head and just just turning the the camera just a little bit. So you should generally you shouldn't have to refocus, but it's always good to take a test shot and refocus. And then once you once you've dialed in the focus and you know that everything's good, then you can start your sequence. So basic camera settings. I generally start with 6400 ISO. I generally start at 30 seconds. Um, if you're stacking, I recommend higher ISOs and faster shutter speeds. I use the 6400 and the 30 seconds just as starting points, just to see how bright is it going to come out, um, how much star trailing am I going to get, and then I always adjust from there. Your white balance can be set anywhere between 3800 and 5000. Um, you can set it to auto. I recommend that if you're doing panoramas though, you do have it at a hard Kelvin temperature because what happens is if you're shooting to the left and you got like city lights over there and you're on auto white balance, your camera is going to make the um, make the white balance different than when you get over to the, the right hand side and there's no city lights over there. And so it's it's not seeing those and you'll end up, what happens is you'll get like a yellow set of images on one side and a blue set of images on the other side and when you put those together you can get um you can get banding in between the in between the images where it's trying to stitch them so i highly recommend that you use it doesn't matter what it is just use a hard kelvin temperature for for your panoramas uh generally a 2.8 lens or wider if you like i said if you're shooting a 1.4 or 1.8 lens i recommend shooting an f2 or 2.2 those generally are the best apertures for that. And then adjust ISO and shutter speed as needed to reduce star trailing. Um, again, consider the 500 rule and then generally try to bring your shutter speed a little bit faster than what that is just to ensure that you're not getting any star trailing. So scout, plan, and shoot. Night photography is fun, easy to do. When you arrive at your location, I highly recommend that the first thing you want to do is to let your eyes adjust to the dark. I know it's, I know you've been driving for a while. You want to check your phone. You want to do all this stuff and, and that's fine, but it's amazing how much you can see. If you just let your eyes adjust to the, the darkness without any other light, you'll be amazed at how much you can see. And then if you do need to use a, a light, I recommend um, using your headlamp on the dimmest setting, or if you need to, if you need to set your camera up or you need once your camera set up, if you need to check something, what I generally do is I use my phone and I just use the light from the screen to to look and see where things are. And that way it doesn't really take away my night vision. All right, so processing software. So I like to use Adobe Camera Raw. Um, Lightroom does the same thing. I personally don't use Lightroom just because I'm 
not a fan of the user interface, but Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, they'll do the exact same things. I like Photoshop. I like DxO Labs, which is formerly Nick Software. I like Topaz Labs. I use that for denoise, and I use it sometimes for um, enlarging older images that I've had. Some images that I shot with like my Canon 5D Mark II that are a little bit smaller. If I need to print bigger, I'll use uh, Gigapixel. I like Starry Landscape Stacker for Macintosh, and I like uh, Sequator for the Windows. So Starry Landscape Stacker is only available for um, Macintosh or, or Apple, and Sequator is only available for Windows. So depending on which system you're using, you can only use one of those. And Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom, organizing images, reading from disks. Um, so Adobe Camera Raw, I like it because you don't have to import your images into, into the, the program. Like Lightroom, if you want to process an image, you have to you have to import it into its own catalog. And for me, that's just a whole bunch of redundancy that I, I'm not a fan of. So I like to use Adobe Camera Raw because I can just point to the image that I want to use and it'll let me start using it. Um, I use these both for, for raw processing. Um, I do use Lightroom sometimes when I'm teaching other people how to do raw processing if they're a Lightroom user. So I say that I use it for both. Um, I do use both. But personally, I just use Adobe Camera Raw. Um, converting images from RAW to TIFF or JPEGs for stacking. So with Starry Landscape Stacker, you actually can use RAW images now. Um, before, you had to convert them to TIFFs or JPEGs. And when doing so, there was absolutely no quality or visual difference between the TIFF or the JPEGs once they were stacked. And the output file is a TIFF. So um, I would I converted them to TIFFs, I've converted them to JPEGs, and I ran them both the same, and the quality and everything is exactly the same. So there's really no difference. Um, masking and local adjustments. Um, the object selection tool is amazing now. If you have uh, an updated version of Camera Raw or Lightroom, the object selection tool does an amazing job, and the masking abilities in these two programs are they're almost making it so where you don't need Photoshop, which is nice. And then there's Photoshop. Photoshop's good for global and selective edits. Um, I use Photoshop a lot for selecting a mask, layers and um, layers of masking, blending, and then fine tuning edits. And I also use Photoshop for resizing for the web. I've done countless tests on excuse me, I've done countless tests on light, with Lightroom about save for web and the different options that it gives you to do that. And I haven't found a better one yet than the way I can do it in Photoshop to re, re, resize my images to share on the web. So um, those are the things that I use Photoshop for the most. DxO Labs, Nick Software. Um, I love the silver effects for the black and white. I like the color effects for the color images and the uh, analog effects for film styles. I will say that I'm not a fan of the def Nick, uh, it's Define for noise reduction. And I'm not too much a fan of the HDR that they have in there. Um, but those don't really apply to night photography anyway. So um for night photography, it would be silver effects, color effects, and analog effects for the ones that I like. And so here's Topaz Denoise. And this is just a single high ISO image. And you can see on the right, it's just a much cleaner image than the image on the left. Topaz Denoise does a good job of the whole image. It analyzes the sky, it analyzes the foreground, and it... Um, it makes the adjustments that it thinks it needs. And then you have the ability to fine tune the image and make the, you can in, include more, uh, you can make more noise reduction or less noise reduction. Um, you can view it at 100%, you can view it at 25%. You can, there's just a lot of things you can do with Topaz Noise. So you can really fine tune it to your liking. Um, I use this a lot for single images if I'm, if I need to. 
Um, you can also sharpen your image with topaz denoise, which is which is a little bit interesting, but it does have a sharpening um, slider in there. So you can actually reduce the noise and sharpen the image all at once. Uh, Starry Landscape Stacker. So this is my preferred method of stacking, and we are actually going to get into that in just a second. So stacking for noise removal, good for the entire image. It masks out the sky. It applies the noise reduction to the entire image, and it also aligns the stars. But because you put a mask on the sky, it doesn't affect the foreground. And so I think it's the best stacking software available. Um, and we're, I'm going to show you guys that here in just a second. So shooting multiple images for stacking. So you take your test shots, take a black frame. When, once you've dialed in your test shots and you know everything's good, take a black frame, start your sequence, and then take another black frame. And that way you can see that the images between the two black frames, those are the images that I know I'm going to stack. Because a lot of the times when we're doing test images, we're moving the camera a little bit, we're adjusting the shutter speed, or we're adjusting the ISO. And with the stacking software, if all the images aren't exactly the same, the, the program will fail because it wants everything the same and it wants the images back to back to back. So by doing this, you'll eliminate a lot of mistakes and you won't have to worry about um, trying to figure out where the mistakes came from or which image doesn't line up right with the rest of them. Or you know, which one did you shoot at 10 seconds while the others were all shot at 15 seconds? Um, so this is a great way to eliminate your mistakes. How to shoot star trails. Take your test shots, get a good high ISO exposure. Determine how long you want your star trails to be. Not, not how long, like physically long, but how long do you want your exposure to be? So if your high ISO test shot is 12,800 at 30 seconds, at 14 millimeters, you just cut your ISO in half and double your exposure time. So every time you cut your ISO in half and you double your exposure time, you're getting the exact same exposure value. So whatever your image looked at looked like at 12,800, 30 seconds is gonna look the exact same at 6,400 and one minute. So you keep doing that until you get down to your desired time so for this example, one hour would be ISO 100 for 64 minutes. And that's going to give you pretty good star trails at 14 millimeters. Um, if you want to, if you're aiming for the full circle, generally an hour is enough. Uh, wide angle lenses up to 24 millimeter is generally good for an hour. And then the longer the lens, the shorter the time you need. So if you're using a uh, like a 50 millimeter lens, you know, you might only have to go um, 20 minutes to get star trails that go through your through your image. And then if you want to really like if you use um, like a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and you're zoomed in at like, let's say, 100, 150 millimeters, you may only need like 10 minutes and you'll have star trails going all the way through your image. So, um, yeah, always take the high ISO test shot get the exposure dialed in, and then just cut your ISO in half and double your exposure until you get down to the desired time that you want your star trails to be. All right, types of noise. This is where we're gonna jump into, uh, I'm gonna describe some noise and then we're gonna go to the demos. So the types of noise. So we have high ISO, super long exposures, which is low ISO, sensor heat, and ambient heat. So in the top left corner, you'll see the comet, the green dot. That's from that that noise is high ISO noise. Right below that is um, high ISO noise in the shadows. So you can't see it in the well exposed areas that up in the top where the comet is, but where you get into the shadow areas, then you see this white noise. And then in the upper right hand corner you see what, what I like to call confetti noise. And confetti noise is caused by doing a super, super, super long exposure um, at a low ISO at night. And I'm gonna show you guys how to remove that. And then sensor heat noise, that's just when your sensor just heats up, it's super hot out. Um, there's a few ways that you can get rid of that. Generally, 
Um, some of it can be taken care of through stacking. And then once you get it down to a manageable level, what I'll generally do is I'll use my color picker, select the magenta, and then adjust it to where it matches with, you know, the brown rock or whatever it may be. But sensor noise um, from a hot sensor is probably the absolute worst. And then I highly recommend that when you're out shooting, um, you don't use red lights. If if you want to, if you want to use your red light to hike into some place, that's fine. Um, but one, once you are set up and you're shooting, I highly recommend no red lights. Use the dimmest setting of a white light on your um, on your headlamp if you need to. Red lights are almost impossible to get rid of once they've been captured on on an image. Um, and I know, sure, you can just retake the image again, but sometimes a red light can be maybe not from your group, but it could be from somebody else's group that's far away, but the red lights just carry a long distance and they can show up in your image and you may not see them with your eye, but they'll be there. So I, I like to stay away from red lights. Uh, a dim white light will do the exact same thing as a red light will as far as keeping your night vision um, under control. And then you can see here, I've used a little bit of uh, white light to illuminate the, the old house. And then the, the bottom image, there's no light at all. So just subtle differences um, to show you that a little bit of light can be a good thing. Um, you don't always have to have no lights at all. Okay, so let's demo some images. So this is this is where we get into some fun stuff. So I am going to go to here. And the first thing we're gonna do is we are gonna stack some images. So I am gonna open up Starry Landscape Stacker. I am gonna choose the files that I want. So it's in the Evergreen Night Photography folder and I have it listed here as the Crest House stack. So I'm just going to open these up and I am going to select all of them. I'm not selecting the first one because that one's already done. So I'm just going to open these up. So now what it's going to do, there's 41 images here. It's going to read them. It's going to analyze them. It's going to say, okay, where's the sky? Where's the foreground? I want to match everything up. And once it populates, it's going to populate with the image. It's going to look like star trails. And it's going to ask me to verify where the um, where the stars are in the sky. And the nice thing about this is we can adjust. Let's say you're shooting like an arch or something, and there's, there's sky through an arch. We can adjust the stars or the mask where that arch is so that it does all the noise reduction and all the aligning of the stars um, in the same in the same process. So I did use full size files on this, so it's taking just a little bit longer, but it's because I want you guys to be able to see the difference of what stacking can really do. And it doesn't take very long. Are there any questions, Ellen, while we wait? That's a really good point. Let me see. We had a fair number of questions. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, do you use or recommend light pollution filters? I do not. I've tried them before and I, I found that all they do is just make the, the image uh, a cooler tone. Okay. I do not know what this is. What is a Botanov? Botanov mask. Steve Allen asks this. I would like to hear how Darren checks focus. And then he says Botanov. B A H T I N O V mask. I've never heard of that. No. Okay. Steve, you're going to have to explain that one to us. Um, Steve it's also asks. Focusing. What's that? It's used for focusing mostly on telescopes, but you can use them on camera lenses. Oh. I, sorry, I've never heard of that before. 
it makes a diffraction pattern and you get the pat like a star and it oh it just... oh yeah it's like a kind of like a filter you hold in front of the lens right yeah I, okay so I, I didn't know that was what it's called um yeah I, i've heard of those but i've never used one yeah I, yeah it, if you magnify the image uh you know more than 10 times on your screen it should be good so yeah okay so now i'll just we'll go we'll do this and then i'll take another question if there is one um, so it's opened up the light frames and it, it's asking me to tell if it's a light frame or a dark flame or a flat, dark or a flat frame. I only use regular light frames. I don't use dark or flat frames. Um, so I'm just going to scroll to the bottom and then I click continue. And now it's going to process these 41 images. Is there one more question? This won't take very long. Okay. Hang on. Let me, uh, let me double check. Um, Steve wants to know if you tried star stack star stacks for star trails. Isn't that what you use it for? Um, star star stacks the program. Yeah, I guess so. The one with the capital X on the end. Yeah, I've used that a long, long time ago, but I don't use it anymore. I didn't find any benefit to it, but that was that was probably eight or nine years ago. So I, I'm not going to say they haven't made improvements but um between starry landscape stacker and photoshop um we can pretty much do everything now with those two programs is wasn't star stacks free yeah i believe it was okay okay so now i have the the image is loaded and you can see that it looks like there's star trails because it's it's each image loaded on top of the on top of one another and the stars are all in a different position. But you can also see that I have the red dots in the sky and that's the program saying, hey, this is where we think that the stars are and this is where we want to make the mask. And so I'm going to say, OK, that's pretty good. What I generally like to do is I generally like to add just click and drag around the edges and try to get as close as I can to some of these and inside this doorway here. And then down here in the clouds around this sign. And this just kind of helps the program get as close to the edge as possible. So now on the left-hand side where it says workflow, I'm gonna come down and I've already added the red dots. And so now I'm gonna click find sky. And based on the red dots, it's going to say, okay, this is where the sky is. And you can see it did a really good job. It, even inside the doorway here, it's masked that out. But up on the top right-hand side, it has, um, on the top right-hand side, it's missed a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that on the left-hand side here, where it says, start with masks, island of sky, I'm going to come down here to where it says paint. I want to make sure it says sky. And then I'm just going to click and drag and, and paint this in. And now I can see that there's a little bit of blue on this rock right here. So I'm just going to click ground and eliminate that. So there's my mask. It has the mask for the sky separated from the foreground. And now I'm just going to click align and composite. And what it's doing is it's taking the middle image, whatever that may be, depending on how many numbers of images I shot, and it's aligning the ones before it and the ones after it to it. So you can actually deter, you can actually tell it which image to align to, but if you don't, it'll automatically default to the middle one. And I've never had a reason to choose anything other than the middle one, but that option is there if you need it. And then it's, so it's, it's aligning and compositing these images. Um, once it does that, the star trails are going to go away. And you're going to see pinpoint stars in the sky. I have a question. Um, do you have to do you have to uh, stack JPEGs only, or will it stack raw? Um, yeah. So so the the program now will stack raw, TIFF, or JPEG. Um, what I like to do personally is I like to convert them to either a TIFF or a JPEG first, because then I can check the color contrast and all that. If you do it, um, if you do the raw files, you don't have that control okay. visually. You don't have the control visually. 
So now it has stacked these together. So I'm going to exit this. <clears throat> and then I'm going to, I'm going to open the good one. And I'm going to go down here and click one that's towards the middle here. And then I'm going to open these both up in Photoshop as layers. And this is just so that I can show you guys the difference between a single image and a stacked image. Okay. Okay, so we have the we have the stacked image on top here. And this is this is the stacked image. And that's the single image. Stacked image, single image. And down here, I like to see like this sign right here in the middle. Like here, you can't even read it. But once it clears up, it's much more legible, especially this one over here, the warning sign about the slippery steps. So single image, stacked image. And that's only with 41 images. So I think that does a really good job. Hopefully you guys can see the difference too. Okay. Next, we are going to get into um, that's the second one, two, right here, pin light blending mode. So this is where we are going to have the white dots in the shadow areas. You guys can see the white dots here in the shadow areas. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to sit here with a clone tool or a healing brush and go through each one of these. So I came up with a way that actually eliminates them in one foul swoop. <clears throat> so what we want to do is over here, we want to duplicate the layer. And I need to move this down here. Can I move this over? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So we want to, we got the layer duplicated and then we want to come up here to filter, noise, and median. So I have my radius set to three and that looks pretty good. It You can definitely see that it has eliminated, it has eliminated the, the white noise. But if we look right here at the arch, we've also lost detail in the arch. And that's not what we want. We want to keep the detail, remove the white noise. So now what we do is we come over here, we click OK, come over here to our blending mode and change this to pin light. So now we have all the detail in the rock and the noise goes away. Just like that. And you may not think that's a big deal, but as soon as somebody orders a large print from you and they get it and they're like, well, why is all this white noise in the down here in the bottom? Uh, they might not order another print from you. So I like to try to have my images as clean as possible before they go out the door. And uh, this is one way to ensure that that happens, especially at, especially with night photography images. So I'll just run through that real quick one more time. Uh, duplicate the layer, filter, noise, median, radius of three, click OK, and change this to pin light blending mode. And then the noise goes away. Okay. Next, we are going to do dust and scratches. Now, dust and scratches is for low ISO, long exposures. So I'm going to make this dark grays easier. So here's where we have what I call the confetti noise. So this is what happens. These are hot pixels that show up in your camera from, from running for a long period of time. So again, what we're going to do is we are going to make a duplicate layer. And we're going to go to filter, noise, dust and scratches. 
And you, this is all going to be dependent on your camera, but I like to start at four and 22 for the radius and threshold. Um, I was messing around with this the other day and actually found that three worked out really well too. So we can preview it and you can see the noise goes away. Now it's not a hundred percent perfect. There's still a little bit of a, a few little dots, but it's 99% perfect. And if you were to print this, it wouldn't be noticeable in the print. So before, after. So that's how to remove the confetti noise. Any questions on those? Let me check. No, it looks like looks like um, everybody's just enjoying your demo. Okay, so we got two more to do. These are a little bit more intense. So here, well, not really, but um, here we are going to blend the example that I showed you before. We're going to blend the static sky with the long exposure foreground. So here we have a, a shot that was 100 ISO and it was a 20, about a 2700 second exposure. So that's what, like 25 minutes, something like that. I don't know, but it's a long exposure. And then we have one exposure here for the sky that was shot at 3200 and it was at 30 seconds. So we're going to blend these two together and I'll show you how to do that. So we're going to select both of them. Go to tools, go to Photoshop, load layers into Photoshop layers. It's the exact same thing if you're in Lightroom. Now, I like to have um, my brighter image on the top. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shift click so that both of these are selected. And then the first thing I want to do is I want to go to auto align layers and just click auto. And you can see you can see that my, my my camera had moved or something, but anyway, so now I have the rock and the sky in the exact same place. So now what I'm going to do with the top layer selected is I'm going to first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to crop this just a little bit to get rid of all that excess. Okay. So with the top layer selected, I'm going to select the sky using my selection brush. And I wanna make sure that it's on the plus and it's at 29 pixels. So I'm just gonna select this. And I wanna make sure also I select inside the arch here, both of these holes here. So now that these are selected, I am going to go to select and mask. And everything looks pretty good here. I'm just going to feather this, the radius, about 18 to 20 pixels. And then I'm going to click uh, Selection for the output, and then click OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click on the, the sky area, and I'm going to select Inverse. So now I have the rock selected. So now what I can do is I can just come down here to my mask where it says layer mask right here and just click that. And then that takes away the, the long exposure star trails and it puts in the static sky. So now I have a super clean foreground, no noise in the foreground, and I got a good static sky to go with that foreground. So. That's one simple way how to blend your images if you do a long exposure foreground at night and then you do your, your sky images. So even if I were to do multiple images for, for noise reduction with the sky, the, the color and the, the quality of a low ISO long exposure foreground is going to be better than if I just took this whole picture and stacked it together. Okay, so whenever you have the opportunity, if you if you can't shoot at sunrise or sunset or blue hour or golden hour for your foreground, 
whenever you're at your location at night, I highly recommend you do at least one image that's a long exposure at a low ISO just for the foreground. You're going to get much better color in your greens and your, your rocks or your houses or whatever it may be that you're shooting. But by selecting the sky, selecting the, the two areas inside the arches, right click, select the inverse so that the rock is selected, and then just click on the mask button. It then makes the mask and allows the static sky to come through. And for people who don't know how to get to this screen, what I did was on this mask, I just hit option and click. So option and click will take you to the mask itself so you can see what's masked out. And then option click will take you back. So that's how to blend long exposure foregrounds with static skies. And now, last but not least, we're going to do a blue hour blend. So this is where I'm taking my, uh, this is my focus stacked foreground that I shot in Arches National Park. This is Park Avenue. And most people who are familiar with this location know that the Milky Way lines up right here in the middle. So we did our focus stacked. We did the foreground. We waited till the light was nice and, and good. It wasn't too bright. We shot the foreground, waited till later that night, and then we took the sky shot. And so we open these up. The first thing we need to do is we need to remove the sky. And this is not this is not just a sky replacement. We're actually going to remove this sky and put in another sky. I suppose you could do the sky replacement, but um, we're going to do it this other way. So with this image, what I want to do is I want to make a duplicate layer. And there's a little trick to this. So the reason that we make the duplicate layer is because we want to make this background copy super contrasty. So we want to make this using a curves adjustment. We want to make this really contrasty. And the reason we do that is so that our mask does better around the rocks. So we'll click OK using our selection tool, quick select tool. We're going to go around the rocks and then once that's done, we are going to go up here to select and mask. And what we want to do is we want to make sure. So if you look in here, you can see that there's blue in here still where the mask didn't pick up. And we don't want that. We want to make sure that there's no blue at all around here. So what we're going to do is we are going to zoom out a little bit. This brush right here, the second one down from the top, is the Refine Edge brush tool. We're just going to select that, make sure it's on the plus. 59 is a good number for this image. And then all we're going to do is we're going to go right around the edges. And that's going to tell it to fill it in where we missed. And I can tell you this works really good with trees as well. You do not have to be precise. The program will detect where the foreground is and where your sky is once you tell it. OK. So now we're going to zoom in. And all that blue is gone now. And that's what we wanted. So now what we want to do is I'm going to shift my edge just a little bit here. We have some options on the right-hand side. I'm going to shift my edge a little bit. I don't want to go out. I want to go more in. Like this here. OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back here to fit screen. And I'm going to leave it as selection. There's a lot of options here, but this one is just going to be selection. I'm going to click OK. And now I'm going to get rid of this top layer. I'm just going to delete it. We don't need it anymore. We've made the selection. It's all still there. 
because this is layer zero, it's not a locked layer now. All I have to do is hit the delete key and it removes the background. It takes care of the sky. So now what I can do is I can take this sky, select all, copy, and then I'll paste it into this. And now what I want to do is I want to make sure that I use the free, nope, not that one. I want to make sure that I'm on the layer of the sky. Use the free transform tool. And just put the Milky Way right where the sky, right where it was. Okay. So now what I want to do is obviously the foreground is too bright and the sky is a little bit too bright. So now what I want to do, this is where we... This is where we match tones and we match um, density and darkness. So on this top layer here, which is the foreground, I want to put a curves adjustment on it. And if I do this, it does the whole thing and I don't want to do the whole thing. So how do I, how do I put the curves adjustment just on the foreground? What I do is I come hold my cursor right in here and I hit the option key. And then I move my cursor a little bit to where I get a down arrow. When I get a down arrow, I click, and that puts a clipping mask on, on this layer that's directly below it. It won't affect the layer of the sky. It'll only affect the layer that's directly below, below it. So now I can adjust the foreground all by itself. The sky is not being touched at all, and this is the beauty of it. So I want to darken this down a little bit to make it a little bit more natural. Okay, so something like that. And then I want to do the same thing with the sky. And so I'm going to make a curves adjustment for the sky. Now, because the sky is the only layer below this adjustment, it's only going to affect the sky now. I could put the clipping mask on it and it'll do the same thing. But I just get in a habit of doing that. So I'm going to make this just a little bit darker. And then I can also adjust the color tones by doing the same thing. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Delete that mask, sorry. This is what I wanted. So I can adjust the color now. I put a color balance mask on it, but now I want to make the clipping mask. And now I can make the sky any color I want it. And it's not going to affect the, the foreground at all. <clears throat> so. I know, here's the blue sky, there's the yellowish sky. I'm just gonna kind of keep it right in the middle for here. Okay, so now this looks pretty good, but I'm gonna show you guys one little trick here that is fairly important. And this, this image here looks pretty good, but I'm gonna show you this anyway, because this is how you can tell a lot of cut and paste jobs. So, the, the next thing I want to do is I want to come down here to create new layer and just add a new layer. And I want this layer to be between the foreground and between the sky. It has to be in between the two. So think of the foreground on top and the sky on the back. And I want this layer to be right in the middle of those two. So now what I'm going to do is the idea of this layer is to cre create more depth in the image between the sky and the foreground. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to my brush tool and I'm going to make it fairly big for this demonstration. And what the idea here is that I want to start with a warmer tone and I want to start somewhere here in the middle. And I'm going to do this four times. So I'm going to come up here to the sky and it doesn't matter where and I'm going to click. And then I'm going to lower the size of the brush a little bit. And then I'm also going to go use my color picker and I'm going towards the white. And then I come back and I put it right on top of this again. And I'm going to do this two more times. And some of you are probably thinking, this dude's crazy. What's he doing? But there's benefit to this. Okay. So now we have this, what I like to call a light layer. And once I have that and it's on its own layer, 
I can hit Control T or Free Transform. And now I can make this light layer as big as I want or as small as I want. Generally, the idea is that I go bigger because I'm trying to get it to be as gradual as possible. And I don't necessarily want it right in the middle. What I'm trying to do here is I want to give a little bit of separation to this rock on the right hand side. So you can see as I move it around, I can put it anywhere I want to. So I'm going to, I'm going to put it kind of just like that there. And you can see that it adds a little bit of depth already. I'm going to click OK. Well, double click to get rid of the free transform. But then what I'm going to do is on my blend mode, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to go to luminosity because the luminosity takes the color away and makes it just a lighter color and makes it look more natural. So now I don't want it at 100%. I'm going to bring this down. See, this is 100%. So I'm going to bring it down maybe to 50% and then toggle it on and off just to see. And I think that looks pretty good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a duplicate layer of layer two, which is the one that I just did. And I'm going to do the free transform again. And now I can bring this anywhere I want it also. So I'm going to bring it just, just down here to the right or left hand corner, just a little bit, click OK. And then on this one, I'm going to bring the opacity down a little bit more because there's already pretty good, a little bit of glow coming out of there. But I just want just a little bit more, just real subtle. So then we have, you can see the difference here. It's real subtle, just, just enough, just, just subtle enough to make it look realistic. And then I can take these and I can flatten these images into one image. And now this is the image that I would start my actual processing on. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole process of it, but that's how to put those two together. And with that, I believe that that concludes the training. If there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Yep.